Yes. I mean, I think we have to recognize as adult leadership that we failed ourselves, we are failing the current generation, and on the current track, unless we can mobilize young people to have more voice between now and Copenhagen to send a clear message to the political negotiators, we are stuck. And I want to appeal to all the older folks in the audience, as well as younger people, that we are now in a, have to, if you pardon me using a rather unfortunate analogy, we have to go into a war situation. That we have to actually be recognizing that unless we change global public opinion and ensure that large numbers of people are putting pressure on the individual governments, then I do not believe we have a chance of getting the kind of ambitious deal that we need in Copenhagen. And that's a challenge for all of us. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we have two rather different views in front of us over here. I know that many different views and many shades and nuances of opinion in the hall in front of us. You're going to have your chance to join in this debate in just a few minutes. We have Jose Maria Figueres Olson, rather more optimistic. He thinks things are changing. He's seen good signals coming out of the US and China, key players. And we have Kumi Naidu, who is beginning to despair, quite honestly, and he thinks we've got to turn to the young, different players. I am a journalist. What are journalists going to write just before Christmas in 2009? What are the headlines that are going to come out of the Copenhagen process? Nisha, can are I we going to see big cuts? Are we going to see small cuts? That's what it's going to be about. Are we going to see 40% cuts in global warming emissions? Or will there be 5%? That's what the headline writers are going to look for. That's what's going to go on the top of the news bulletins around the world. So I'm going to ask you guys, what do you think? Um, can I, well, Jose Maria first, you're the optimist. How high do you think the Kumi, cuts will Kumi be? Kumi wants to get something in uh, here in the space. I, I just wanted to close that last discussion by saying that I'm much more optimistic since President Bush left the White House and Obama came. Uh, I, I do think there is a different optimism, but it's not where it needs to be. Sorry. So he's an optimist, but... So, Jose Maria, people are going to judge it on those numbers. What do you think we'll see? Well, or hear? Michel, if, if, if you're waiting until the end of December to see what you're going to put on the headlines, I think you're not fulfilling your responsibility as a journalist. And what I want to say with that is that this is just too very important to be left in the hands of political leaders by themselves. This requires a multi-stakeholder coalition like we have never ever seen before if we are going to decouple growth from carbon emissions. Because the second war that we need to win in this century is the war against poverty. And therefore the need to continue to grow and fulfill the aspirations of peoples moving towards that low carbon economy. But this the reality requires much is, more the reality than just is that leadership. is what people want to hear. This that is how it's going to be judged. Kyoto gave us 5%. What is Copenhagen going to give us? That is how it is going to be judged. Kyoto, Do you really think we're going to see 40% cuts in global emissions? Kyoto 30%, was a very, 20%? Kyoto was a very good first earnest attempt at beginning to develop a framework through which we could move ahead on this issue. Not all countries lived up to their commitments or what to what we would have expected of them in Kyoto. But I'm not going to throw Kyoto out the window. I am going to say let's build on what we have we need to now move into a second generation agreement in Copenhagen. And part of the leadership that we need at Copenhagen is leadership that will decide at that point in time whether we have a high quality agreement or we have a mediocre agreement. And in that case, decide to meet again instead of going with a mediocre agreement. What I don't want coming out of Copenhagen is somebody said, ah, Costa Rica did the best they can, but then they switched and India came in and China said this and the U.S. that, patati patata, and so we did the best we could. That gets political leadership off the hook. It takes the climate change issue off the immediate agenda, which is a luxury we cannot afford. Between a good agreement, I'm sorry, between no agreement at Copenhagen and mediocre agreement at Copenhagen, I prefer no agreement. That will put the onus on the leadership to reconvene and give us the quality agreement we need. Really? Yes, really. And that is completely counterintuitive to our political system. Because our political system is a system that very unfortunately goes para los promedios, como decimos en español. It goes to the averages, to the least common denominator. What everybody could finally agree to in the agreement when they took everything out of the agreement that was important. 
That is not what we need on this time. This time we need a high quality agreement. That, why, that is why this time we need a multi-stakeholder coalition from the very beginning. And we need you, the journalists, the media, the people in communications, in the thick of the debate from now, not waiting to see what you're going to print on the headlines come the end of December. Okay, Kumi Naidu, do you think that if it's not a high quality agreement, then it's not worth it? If you don't have everyone on board agreeing to something dramatic, then it's simply not worth it? Well, I'm very optimistic suddenly because I realize that my good, good friend, Jose Maria Figueres, is influenced by crazy people like myself because that is part of the slogan that we always say, no deal is better than a crap deal. And if ever, sorry, um, uh, if, ever there was language, a time, if there ever there was a time where that message is relevant, you know, we've said it around trade negotiations and many other things, and, and I want to say that it's around this. However, I'm an optimist fundamentally, and I have to say that right now as we sit in this all year in Geneva, we should be saying to ourselves, it ain't over until it's over, right? There's a lot to struggle for. There's a lot to fight for. There are young people, not only in this room, but across the world that are organizing some themselves. There are folks in the churches and other religious institutions are coming out and saying we have to put pressure on Copenhagen. And so as we sit right now, we should not be throwing the towel in. If anything, the media should be posing that very important question that you've posed to our leaders right now uh, to pull some of them out, let them play their cards, because let's be very honest, the other problem with the whole negotiations, this question of 5% and 40%, for the 95% of the people on this planet, it's a meaningless figure. Because the way this whole conversation is going, it's a very elite conversation. We have not uh, actually deconstructed what the challenges in more simple terms that ordinary people can engage with. But and that that's is part the language of, what of the do. negotiators, yes. isn't no, no, it? Uh, very technical. It's very technical. Very excluding. Exactly. Do you think that they are open to pressure from outside? Well, the I kind think, of campaigns I you're going to run, the kind I of campaigns that were going to be launched here in Geneva tomorrow. Do you really think that the leadership at the Copenhagen uh, conference in, in uh, December, the negotiators who are spending the next six months living and breathing it, are going to be listening? I think that that's a responsibility not for the negotiators at Copenhagen. That is our responsibility, decent men and women who, f who are saying that this is the last chance we have. We have to turn this around if we're going to save this planet for current and future generations. And that onus of being able to be more smarter with the way we deal with media, more smarter in the way we campaign, more accessible in our language, more diversity in the languages that we use of uh, campaigning and all, I feel that that's a responsibility that rests with us. And if we can get it right in the next couple of months, then I believe political leaders at the negotiations will feel the pressure and hopefully will shift in the direction that we need them to. That's the only chance we have. If they are left to their own devices, they will do exactly what Jose Maria said. It will be business as usual and will get a really weak deal in Copenhagen if they are left to their own devices. Jose Maria, you didn't give me an answer on the 40, 25, 15 you said there's a difference between a good quality, a mediocre, or a truly rubbish deal. Can I ask you this question? In Kyoto, the whole issue of the impact of climate change now on people here and now, the human impact, people hadn't really woken up to it. The amount of money set aside for adaptation, as it's called, was derisory. Are we going to see a sizable amount of money put aside to help weak communities become resilient to deal with the horrific effects of climate change right here and now? 